Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to February's Good Employment Charter webinar. Uh, really pleased to have you uh, along this afternoon. Um, before we get into the, uh, the details of uh, the, the webinar today, um, first of all, I'm Ian MacArthur, head of the Good Employment Charter, but just some housekeeping. Um, the webinar works best on Chrome, so if you're trying to view this on some other browser, perhaps swap to Chrome and it will be um, a better experience for you. If you have any problems, just hit the refresh button um, and it should uh, reload. Um, on the right hand side, you will see uh, a chat function as well as a questions function. Um, questions, obviously, pop them into the, uh, the questions uh, bar and we'll, um, we'll answer them as we go through. Um, but please try and use the, uh, the chat function as well. Um, we know we're using these events as a substitute for networking events. So uh, the, the chat function will help you connect to other supporters and colleagues of the Good Employment Charter. As always, this session will be recorded um, and will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, we'll also send it to supporters and there will be a blog right up at the end that you'll be able to access and share with colleagues. I was reflecting this morning, it's now 338 days since the Prime Minister put us into some form of restriction on the 23rd of March last year. Um, the roadmap that was published earlier this week um, takes us potentially to the 21st of June. That will be 455 days in restrictions. Um, and it seems to me that we've moved through the period of coping with the coronavirus and the restrictions it's placed on us. And we are, we've had a response phase, if you like. But now we're coming to terms with the fact that we're going to have to live with this for some considerable time. Um, and we need to understand what that means, not just in the short term for good employment, but looking further ahead. So I'm extremely pleased to have Gail Irving uh, with us today. Gail is the Senior Policy and Development Officer at Carnegie UK. Carnegie, um, uh, for those of you who don't know, was Andrew Carnegie, was a uh, philanthropist, uh, Scottish-American, who made literally hundreds of millions of pounds um, with uh, the, the steel industry in, in the States. Um, and who towards the end of his, his life gave most of it away for philanthropy um, and that um, endowment still funds research today by uh, Carnegie in the UK. Carnegie seeks to improve the lives and well-being of people throughout the UK, particularly those that are in disadvantage. Um, and the goal is to change minds by influencing public policy and change lives through innovative practice and partnership. And the focus really is on enabling well-being through fulfilling work in this particular area. So I think um, we really are very lucky to have Gail and Carnegie supporters today with uh, the webinar. Gail's work, um, recent, recent publication towards the end of last year, uh, published a, uh, a, what I think is a really important piece of work uh, entitled Moving Good Work Forward in the, the Coronavirus Age. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Gail to present the findings of that report, and I'm sure it will lead to a number of questions about how we prepare to live with coronavirus moving forward. Gail, over to you. Thanks very much for joining us. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me on here today. Um, do we have some have some slides to share? Are we able to bring those up now? I'm sure, Raj will be able to do that for us. Here we go. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you for the, the words of introduction, Ian. Um, as you mentioned, the Carnegie UK Trust works around the UK and Ireland. Um, and in a you know the old world, I used to have the privilege of occasionally getting down to uh, Greater Manchester. Uh, to see the development of the Good Employment Charter um, over the last few years. So I'm really, really pleased to be able to, to speak to you today, albeit very sad that we're doing it via laptops and not able to, to actually mingle and chat about these issues in person, but hopefully one day, one day again soon. Um, so as Ian said, for the, the last few years, we've had a focus on 
the contribution that good work makes to wellbeing. Uh, and we've been very interested in trying to advance good work as a policy goal across the UK and Ireland, and also looking at interesting practice happening within the nations and regions of the UK on, the, on that, that front. Our last year of activity has been very much dominated by trying to understand the place of good work, um, both the, the lived reality of good work, but also the policy opportunities and challenges posed by COVID. And that's what produced this report uh, published last October, Good Work for Wellbeing in the Coronavirus Economy. So I'm going to take the next 15 minutes or so just to talk through some of the key findings of that research. I'm really keen to, to hear your views and how they resonate with what you've been trying to do in your own businesses. We have uh, 11 key messages fr from this report. It's a report with quite a lot of breadth, but distilling that down at uh, key message number one, just to get you um, thinking about our positioning in this report is the message that yes, protecting jobs must be a priority of governments and of individual businesses. Right now, we have no, under no illusion whatsoever about the huge challenges facing businesses just trying to keep the lights on and to keep going and hold on to the jobs and the staff that you have and get through this really challenging period together. So of course we have to have a focus on protecting employment levels, but we also think that there has been insufficient focus to date, particularly from the UK government, on sustaining, protecting and achieving good work for more people. And we think that we need to embed a focus on good work in our responses to the pandemic and in thinking about the future, how we build back better. Otherwise, we risk making the same mistakes as the last recession, where we saw employment return, but large numbers of people around the country being trapped in low paid, insecure work. We saw rising public discontent and work poverty, worker insecurity. And we would fail to reward the huge sacrifices that citizens have made over the last year, particularly key workers in working, perhaps in some cases, in low paid, insecure jobs, keeping the country functioning. And from a more hard nosed point of view, we also risk putting a dampener on the economic recovery if we don't think about good work, because we know from the evidence that good work is positively linked to improved worker productivity. So that's our starting point uh, in this report. And just to give you a bit of background to how we produced the report, uh, central to the process was qualitative interviews with 18 labour market experts external to the Carnegie UK Trust and that included academics, business and trade union representatives, think tanks, campaign groups, etc. And the purpose of that was to try and tap into what this whole range of organisations were observing happening in the labour market, happening to job quality. We started this research way back in, I think, April, May last year. So it was all unfolding in real time. And we also carried out ongoing desk research of the emerging evidence to look at the main impacts on job quality arising from the pandemic, how these were falling on different groups of workers, and how might the crisis impact the overall public debate and policy impetus around good work. Because Prior to the, the pandemic and the years going up to it, there had been this increased focus on good work as being what we should be aiming for in our labour market and our economy, to the extent that the UK government even produced its own good work plan and had that as part of it, an industrial strategy. But clearly the, the rise in unemployment, the huge amount of effort and resources needed to go into fighting the pandemic and getting businesses through the pandemic has changed the calculation a bit in terms of the bandwidth available to tackle job quality issues. So all of this is part of what we were trying to assess in our report. So before I go any further, I should maybe pause to clarify what we mean by good work. Uh, and you notice I use the words good work and job quality interchangeably. Um, and there's, there's multiple definitions of good work. We don't get too hung up on the, the precise definitions and the semantics around this. It's all for us, it's about trying to look at higher standards of employment quality that benefit people's lives, basically, rather than the basic statutory minimums of what is legally allowed in terms of employment conditions. We use as a framework for our analysis of changes to job quality in the report, a seven dimension framework of good work that I've put on the slide in front of you. 
you can see those uh, seven dimensions in coloured writing and the metrics that sit beneath those are on the slide as well. This seven dimensions framework was produced by a cross-sectoral working group process that we convened with the RSA back in 2018. Um, and I think there's, there's quite a lot of overlap with the Good Employment Charter criteria as well in here. Um, but I think the key thing to say with regard to this is that we see good work as a multi-dimensional concept. It's not just about pay, although pay is, is really important, particularly for people on very low incomes, but it's also about job security, uh, the predictability of your hours, whether work is good for your physical and mental health, the support and uh, relationship you have with your colleagues and your line manager, your work-life balance, opportunity to, opportunity to use your voice, to use your skills, to have some opportunities for progression. All of this is what for us makes a, a, a job good quality. So that's what we're trying to assess uh, in our work and in this report. So, as I say, we distilled the key messages of the, re the report into uh, 11 key points, which I'm going to just take a few minutes and talk through with you now. I've already covered point number one, we need to have a dual focus on protecting employment and keeping our, our focus on protecting and advancing good work for more people. The second point is that pay packets and incomes are under severe pressure and that low paid workers need and have earned a pay rise. In writing this, we were thinking particularly about uh, the people who have been furloughed on 80% of their wages, which is obviously not a lot of money if you're on low pay to begin with. Uh, we're thinking about people who have not been able to access the range of COVID support schemes, have fallen through the gaps in those schemes, uh, have had to rely on universal credit or statutory sick pay, or have been otherwise unable to access the hours they need to get by in life. Huge pressures on people's incomes in the here and now, but also likely to see pay restraint in the time to come as businesses struggle to adapt to the pandemic. And this is all bad news and concerning for workers because we've already had a decade of lost real page pay growth. Very similarly, we are concerned that precarious work is likely to be on the rise again. And that is following a decade where we've seen the growth of some precarious working models like zero hours contracts, which of course do work for some people and suit uh, their lifestyles, but for many others it means they cannot guarantee the kind of hours, the kind of income uh, that they need to have a sense of security and to get on in life. We're saying that health, safety and psychosocial wellbeing have moved to the job uh, top of the job quality priority list. Uh, it goes without saying it's been a public health crisis and we've all had additional pressures on our physical and mental health during this last year. Thinking particularly about those workers who have been in frontline public facing roles where they've perhaps not been able to control their exposure to COVID. Um, but also thinking about the implications physical on physical and mental health for those of us working from home, very different way of working, new, new pressures, new anxieties. And we know that across the board, anxiety and depression has really increased um, as a result of people trying to, to get through the experience of this pandemic. So there's a lot to be concerned about under the banner of health and well-being. Um, but on the other hand, there's also been renewed scrutiny and, and discussion about the role that employers can, can play in supporting their staff's physical and mental health, which might in the future get us to a place where we have a more reasoned progressive debate about this but unfortunately still feels like there's quite a lot of pain to get through first. We're also observing the report that the crisis has placed a huge strain on work-life balance for many workers. And there is the potential for improved work-life balance through more remote and flexible working, but this opportunity is not shared equally across the labour market. And even for those of us who have been working from home, there's obviously the extent to which that works for us, that is good for our mental health, for our, our sense of connection, differs wildly depending on your personal circumstances. Key workplace relationships, including those between colleagues and those between managers, managers and staff have been tested during the pandemic. And that applies to people that have been going into their normal place of work, as well as those of us who've been trying to, to operate teams and manage people in a remote setting. We've also found that many workers have had limited involvement in key decisions in their workplaces during the pandemic. 
And the way that work is organised has, has changed massively over the last year. And there's been loads of really difficult, fast moving decision making required within companies. You would have hoped that workers have, ha have had a chance to express their views, to be consulted on these big changes. And of course, there was the, a requirement on employers to consult their staff on making workplaces COVID secure. But the evidence suggests that in practice has been, employer practices have been mixed in terms of this. Um, CIPD data suggests, for example, that only 44% of staff feel they were adequately consulted on making workplaces COVID secure. And it seems there's a lack of understanding and guidance about how do you consult meaningfully in non-unionised workplaces. We're saying that investment in skills and training is going to be a key priority in the coming years. And this is an area that many of you will know the UK has not performed particularly strongly on in the last 10, 15 years. And we need to get better at doing it quickly. We're very concerned overall that the pandemic is deepening inequalities in access to good work. With many of the groups of workers most adversely affected by the pandemic, those who entered the pandemic already in relatively bad quality work, where there, were, there was a ceiling placed on the kind of work they could access. I'm thinking, for example, about women, about ethnic minority workers, young people, people with low formal skills, and people in precarious forms of employment. They have all borne the brunt of this crisis from a low base in terms of job quality to begin with. So this is all very concerning. And we sum up by saying that we need to have a multi-strand strategic approach to deliver a renewed job quality vision. And we should be ambitious in setting that vision for a renewed focus on good work coming out of COVID. So what do we say needs to happen? The report sets out over 30 recommendations for government, employers and civil society to make good work part of the COVID-19 labour market and the recovery. Many of our recommendations are targeted at UK government, partly because we want them to take leadership on this issue. But there is clearly a huge role for employers to take action. And we are very aware that it is employers, mostly private sector employers, who design jobs um, and who exert this huge influence on the day-to-day -day experience of work of their employees. And there is so much that employers can do to try and improve working lives, or at least not make working lives worse for people as we move through this pandemic. And also a role for businesses to be thinking about how they can embed good work in their future business plans. What is the business contribution to building back better? It's not just about individual employers. We also think there's a huge role for employer networks. Uh, and one of the recommendations in the report is about local action. We say that all UK local authorities, towns and cities should look at their approach to driving good work using the levers available to them. And they should consider joining or forming local good work business pledges or networks or signing up to the Living Wage Places accreditation scheme in order to expand the provision and expectation of good work in their area and champion local employers committed to good work ideas. And I wanted to pick that out because obviously this is exactly what you're trying to do in, in the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter. And we think developing these, particularly these place-based networks, is really, really important to try and get these networks of practice around good work and, and raise people's expectations of what is possible. This slide is an at-a-glance summary of our 32 areas of recommendations. I'm not going to talk through them all, obviously, um, but I just wanted to put those up for you so you can see how we are looking across the, the seven dimensions and also some of these big picture cross-cutting issues. You can access a summary of all the recommendations and key messages. Uh, we have a shorter paper encapsulating all of that on our website, carnegieuktrust.org.uk. I'd be, be delighted, of course, if you have time to read that and let me know what you think. But just in the next, the last few minutes, I want to focus on a few areas of recommendations that I thought might be of particular interest to the discussion today uh, and talk a little bit about where we see the role of employers and government within these. So on health, safety and wellbeing, I, I've already said this has become an issue under renewed scrutiny and it you know, feels incredibly important in work now because of the pandemic. From a government point of view, we think that the UK government needs to conduct 
uh, an urgent review of whether there is sufficient resources and infrastructure in place to support employers to fulfil their duty of care towards their staff's physical and mental health. And a big part of that is about ensuring that the inspection and enforcement regime is fit for purpose in the COVID age, particularly looking at the remit and the resources of the health and safety executive, and also ensuring that the resources are there for local governments, regional governments as well, to do their thing in supporting some of that compliance enforcement work. Um, but for employers as well, there's there's been a real wealth of resources created over the pandemic from different employer networks like the CIPD, the CPI, and of course, uh, Greater Manchester's uh, own resources, trying to help employers understand what they can do to, to make sure they fulfill their duty of care. But it is a wealth of resources and quite overwhelming. So there, perhaps there is a role for more um, condensing those resources or more clearer signposting from government and other networks so employers can, can manage to get uh, the responsibilities right here amid all the other things they're trying to deal with. Um, on job design and work-life balance, we'd like to see evaluations of the impact of remote working on individuals, business outcomes, and opportunity across the job market. Uh, and those evaluations we think need to happen within businesses. Businesses need to look at, if they have been remote working during this period, what has the impact been on individual worker wellbeing, on the ability for teams to work together constructively, and on business productivity. And they need to factor all of those things and the views of their staff into making future decisions about remote working. But we also think we need to see national level research commissioned into this, particularly to understand uh, those sectors and occupations where working from home is not viable, and indeed understand what groups of workers it is not desirable for, it doesn't really work for their needs and their, their preferences. We need to get a much clearer understanding of how remote working has been experienced and could be experienced and what other forms of flexibility could be expanded coming out of this experience. And again, we have a point here about improving employer practice to support wellbeing in this regard, and um, particularly teams working remotely. I think a key point about that is, um, which is, is a recommendation across the board really, but is about looking at the support and resources, the training available to line managers to try and manage this really difficult task of supporting their people and also managing their own resilience during this difficult time. And finally, I just wanted to finish on voice and representation because we think there is a real need to uh, build up worker voice and workplace dialogue in the UK, particularly to navigate all of the changes and challenges ahead. And we think that requires a two-pronged approach. One is about removing the barriers to trade unions to represent workers effectively. But the other one is also about identifying and strengthening other mechanisms of voice, of voice which are shown to be effective. And there's a part for employers to play in um, looking at what consultation they have done during the pandemic. What have the outcomes been? What has worked and what hasn't worked so well? But I think there's also a place for government to provide stronger guidance and support to help um, employers consult meaningfully in non-unionised settings. And would hope that we might see more of that firmer guidance and signposting when we get to the next wave of reopening workplaces. So I'll just come to a conclusion now, but I just wanted to say that I know none of this is easy looking at these, how you can try and protect and embed good work um, in, in the, the way staff are doing their jobs right now, and then thinking about how to adapt to the future trading situation when there's still so much uncertainty. It is not easy to do this, this joint focus on protecting jobs and protecting job quality, neither for businesses or for government, I don't think. But something that is very helpful about having this multidimensional concept of good work is that you can look at well, what levers can I pull now? If some of these are more difficult right now, what else can I do to try and improve job quality for my people? And I think voice is a really key part underpinning all of this because it's by being able to speak to your staff, to engage with your staff, that you understand what matters most to them and you can try and work together to navigate any trade-offs that might be, might be needed to get through this, this pandemic together. So I will just draw to a close there so we can maybe stop sharing the, the slides. Thank you very much for your attention.
I was almost guilty of not pressing my unmute button there. That would have been another pound in the jar. After all this time, you'd have expected me to know that. But um, okay, normally, uh, in normal times, we'd all be doing this. We'd all be a round of applause. And thank you very much for your overview of the, uh, of the report. Um, I think there's lots in there. Um, I'm hoping that people will start generating some questions uh, in the questions tab for you. Um, but because it's such a um, all-encompassing subject, it, there's so many strands to good employment, as we know. Um, and if you were to um, pick out a priority for employers to think about um, addressing moving forward, maybe, uh, and you've alluded it to voice, but is there something there about uh, setting a culture um, we, we often find, Gail, in the conversations that we have through these webinars and elsewhere that culture set by leadership makes such a difference to the whole organisation. So have you got any reflections on that? Yeah, I think that is, that's definitely true. I suppose one of my reflections on the cultural change and leadership point in, in the context of having gone through a year of this pandemic is how it does require a bit of time and a bit of breathing space in most organisations to, to have the capacity to do that step back and do that strategic thinking. Um, and I think most organisations, if they had that, they felt they had the space to take that breath and they had you know, the people around them to have those conversations with at a senior level. They would see the value in trying to make sure there's good mechanisms for voice to speak to staff, to engage with staff. But in a crisis, it doesn't always feel possible. Um, and I think going forward, there's still so much uncertainty about the final economic cost of, of some of the, the, the pressures on businesses over the last year. And I could see different businesses starting to worry about um, how they can manage all of the changes to come and whether there will be um, there's any risks to involving staff, engaging staff too much uh, in terms of how you navigate these changes in a way that is a satisfactory outcome for workers and for the survival of the business. So I think there's there's lots to think about on how you consult staff meaningfully and how you set that, that cultural expectation where it's normal to try and have a dialogue with your staff. Um, but I, I think in many, particularly smaller businesses that haven't don't necessarily have all that many different um, levels of, of, of strategy of management of leadership it might have been hard to catch your breath even at any point over the last mm. year to really think about that no, i think that's right i think one of the things that we're focused in on and we'll be working with um, acas and cipd in the coming uh, weeks and months is that line management piece and making sure that line managers are effectively equipped for the new world that they're facing and in many ways um, and it's not my words but it's the golden thread that runs through um, a lot of good employment practice mm -hmm. is to have um, line managers that are empowered uh, to, to, to manage those uh, relationships and I think particularly again something we're working with uh, partners on is finding alternative ways um, to engage with and take the pulse of your staff um, particularly in this very kind of dismembered uh, way and of, of, of working at the moment. Yeah. We have a question. Um, I think we've got a couple of questions here from Devon, actually. So, Devon, thanks for your question. One of the, the cohorts that have been badly affected by the lockdown and restrictions is the over 50s. There seems to be uh, little vacancies for them and apprentices is, is, a, is presumed for young people. I mean, we've, we've worked about and, and looked at um, the ageing working population, but what do you think moving forward, Gail? Is there um, a challenge there that we need to rise to? Yeah, I think there is a challenge. I think um, it's, there has, even in the labour market before the pandemic of the last sort of 10, 15 years, there has been a focus on youth unemployment and perhaps less of a focus on looking at um, older age groups and some of the, how you would help some of those groups who are more likely to be in long-term employment if they find themselves out of work, how you can design services to support them back into jobs if they want to continue working. So I think it's a bit of a, a policy and practice gap that we've had for quite a long time in the UK. 
Um, but I guess from a public provision point of view, there, there will have to be a weighing up of resources in terms of how many schemes are designed and tailored with helping young people in mind and how many are a bit more broad in their outlook or tailored to, to older workers. And again, I feel like it's a bit of a blind spot in all of the, the um, job search and support and training packages announced so far by the Chancellor. They do seem to have, all, have a very small targeted focus on young people out of work who are long term unemployed, which feels a little bit like you're letting a lot of damage happen before you even offer any public interventions. And I think that's the same case with, with older age groups. It feels doesn't feel like the right approach to just let people be left. Um, but there will, I suspect, will be more packages if, if public support forthcoming as well. Yeah, well, let's see what the Chancellor does uh, shortly. Um, Carmel's asked a question. Do you have any advice on people who are not looking forward to the restrictions being lifted in relation to coming back to work and wider support? I think this is a really interesting question. Um, I was on a, a call yesterday with some business rep organisations who summarised um, there'll be generally young people who are desperate to get back into the office, um, who are uh, can't wait for that social interaction and that buzz again. There's those that maybe Carmel's uh, uh, alluding to that are really quite reluctant and resistant of entering back into that world. And then there's those that um, are kind of scratching their head, going, is it a good idea? I'm not sure, maybe not. I'm, I'm, you know, I'd have to taste it and see. What do you think, uh, Gail? What's your, your, your advice to Carmel? Um, I think, I mean, I, I, this is clearly going to be uh, something that dominates our conversations for the next couple of years is, is looking at how do we what is the future of the workplace after this experience and I mean from the most of the polls that I read it feels like there's a bit of a 50-50 divide and it is very much a, a generational and lifestyle divide between those who are absolutely chomping at the bit to get back to normal social workplaces and those who find that working from home actually suits them quite well mm -hmm usually because they have a more comfortable environment to do so or because they have a family that they quite like seeing a bit more of at home with them. So I think there is there is a bit of a risk of a generational split and it's not entirely clear to me that there's much public policy awareness and media awareness of that split. Um, it seems to me, and I might be biased because I'm someone who's dying to go back to the office, um, but I feel like there is much more discourse about the idea that we will be much more and likely to be happy working from home going forward. And I think there's, as you're alluding to, there's actually very mixed feelings and there's some real risks and opportunities of, of hybrid working, of continued working remotely and of getting everyone back into the office in a big bang type style. So lots to think about. I don't think I have particular advice, but I think this, the starting point would be for us to talk a lot more about these differences and ensure that there's not there's no one group that's their views and preferences are being completely left out of the public policy and the media debate. Also the employer decisions because employers are influenced by what they hear in the media and the signals that are sent through public policy. I think one of the issues we've linked to this is, is around inequalities as well. And again, going back to the line management piece about this, how do you manage differentially mm -hmm. uh, for those that don't want to come back into the office for whatever reason, um, and, you know, um, those that do and that presenteeism against that perceived ab absenteeism um, and, and, in development and progression moving forward. So I think that's something that we, we all need to be aware of and build up into our um, the way we support line managers going forward. Rob has asked a, a really interesting question for you. Um, one proposal is asking employers and uh, employees to spend some of the government's support specifically on reskilling, particularly for older workforce more prone to uh, automation, etc. Uh, does Carnegie have a view on enforced reskilling credits? We don't have a. We haven't done a lot of detailed work on the variety of schemes that could support reskilling and training more broadly. I think we our, our starting point is that we probably need to have a variety of different schemes and initiatives that are trying to um, incentivize both employers to provide more training and more kind of reskilling uh, modules for different different skills 
um, to respond to skills gaps and changes and moving about of jobs, uh, at roles and jobs after the pandemic. But there does need to be more government provision put to this as well. And I think there's, there's lots of proposals out there around forms of individual learning accounts and um, portable qualifications and, and things like that, which I'm sure all have a lot of merit to them, but it still feels like getting a, a more bold and diverse proposal about how you really support training and reskilling is um, there's a lot of small c conservative thinking from certainly from the UK government on that, although again, there might be better, more responsive initiatives happening at devolved or regional levels. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, can I move on to one of the issues that's um, burdened, I think, Green Manchester throughout the, the, the pandemic and, and has troubled us from day one, um, and that's precarious work, um, particularly um, those people um, who have been asked to isolate through um, the pandemic, yet because of the um, precarious nature of their contract or their, their working conditions, or even perhaps just the management culture of the organisation, deem that they will not self-isolate, uh, thereby exposing uh, their, their colleagues, perhaps their clients, um, to, uh, to, to coronavirus risks. Um, it's a it's a big issue, I think, particularly in the what perhaps we could call the forced gig economy. Um, not quite gig economy by choice, but it's a kind of um, take it or leave it kind of gig economy. And perhaps mm -hmm. the Supreme Court decision last week on Uber may have mm -hmm. some impact on this down the line. But it'd be really interesting to get your views uh, around what support perhaps is needed for self-isolation through this period? Yeah, I think the more support is, is definitely needed, but I, I think it's both looking at the, what financial support could enable people to self-isolate, for example, but also there are more complicated aspects. I mean, that, that shouldn't be too hard, but again, we have, we have seen resistance at UK level to try and deploy a scheme that could be could be easily accessed by people and would be generous enough to enable them to to self isolate without massive shocks to their income. Um, I don't know if we'll see much more improvement on those schemes. I certainly hope so, um, or even just improving statutory sick pay, sick pay in one blow, so that it could it could become um, a payment to compensate people during this time. Um, so there's the financial one shouldn't be that hard to do in in theory, but in practice seems to be quite difficult. But there's also the behavioural barriers, which I think you alluded to when you talked about people that might just, just not have a workplace where there is a management culture that makes them feel they can isolate, they feel pressure to, to go and do the job. Um, and people, I think we also often forget in this debate about how horrible it is for a lot of people to be told to stay inside for 10 or 14 mm -hmm. days. And lots of people live in one bedroom house flats without access to any fresh air. There's a lot of good re reasons why people are reluctant to self-isolate. It's, it's not just financial, it's also a kind of cultural thing um, and just a human need to, to not be so, so isolated. So I think there's need for a much more reasoned debate about that in terms of public health response. And in terms of precarious work more generally, I mean, you alluded to zero hours contracts earlier, figures released by ONS yesterday um, suggest that there's uh, now a million um, people working with zero hours contracts across the country um, and uh, a growing proportion of those uh, being young people which um, uh, is it, difficult when you're starting to plan and move forward in your career. What, what's Carnegie's view on um, the, the, the zero hours contract culture if you like that, that seems to be um, growing again? Yeah, I think um, I think the zero hours contracts are, although they have they are growing, and it is concerning. They've always been just the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of various forms of precarity that exist through through jobs in the labour market. Um, our view is is in terms of whether you would want to ban zero hours contracts. We don't really feel that we have the evidence to to understand um, some of the, the risks, opportunities, and trade offs of that. Um, I think what would be really interesting would be to see if it was possible to evaluate the, the, the success 
and the outcomes of um, the scheme that took place, at, well, the act that went forward in Ireland last year, which banned zero hours contracts in most circumstances, but did still allow some limited use of them, and which also introduced things like payments for cancelled shifts and minimum notice of shifts from employers mm -hmm. to their staff. Um, I think all of those elements are a package of measures that could be quite proportionate and could try and I think what we're trying to get to is, is incentivise employers to, to forward plan a lot better um, and to recognise the need for people to have a degree of security unless they expressly opt out of that and say actually no a zero contract is fine for me because I'm just studying and I just want to do this when you've got a job something to do for me um, but we also you know we're coming through a pandemic where business trading has been so dramatically impacted, I think it's quite hard to know at this juncture um, how much forward planning employers can be expected to do as well. So there's a, there's a whole new set of difficulties. Um, but one, a starting point would be, it'd be great to try and have a look at what's happened in Ireland while recognising they've also been fighting a pandemic for the last year. So it won't have been normal circumstances to test that, 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 uh, that legislation out. Maybe that's something we can talk about in terms of research um, outside of this meeting, Gail. It'll be really, really interesting, I think. Um, one more question for me, and then uh, perhaps we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, uh, and it, it's in the context of the real living wage. Um, our mayor has set out a vision for Greater Manchester to become a real living wage city region. It would be one of the first. Um, uh, there are living wage places at a borough level, but not uh, at a city wide region. Um, and I know that you've done some work recently on minimum wage as well. Um, and it would just really be good to get your reflections on um, how important um, we focus now on uh, achieving a real living wage. Um, and perhaps alluding to some of the barriers that we need to overcome in persuading employers that the real living wage is just what it says it's poverty alleviation it, it, it is um, a, a, a baseline upon which um, we really should not sink below yeah i think the living wage initiative has been something that has gone from strength to strength in the last 10 years and i hope it will continue despite you know the pressures on businesses from the pandemic and it seems like the early signs, certainly there was a lot of growth in living wage employers last year, which kind of took me by surprise because I thought many employers would be kind of waiting out to try and see, try and have a, a clear assessment of whether they could meet those um, uplifts in living, the living wage that happened year on year. I think one of the successes of the living wage is that it, it does have a really, really strong business case. And they do, you know, they have really compellingly presented evidence from using the words of businesses that join the living wage to explain how it has positively impacted on staff morale, staff effort, reduced staff absences and all of that. And I think you know, the Living Wage Initiative, because it's a voluntary thing, it's always going to have a ceiling. And I think the space for policymakers is to look at how they can continually push that up and what other policies need to come in to support um, you know, a, a minimum wage floor, but also encourage employers to go higher than that. Um, but we, I think the business case is helpful because while I understand that most employers that do become living wage accredited, they do it and really because they think it's the right thing to do because they see the anti-poverty argument and the idea that yeah. a, a day's work should command a real living wage, but they can sell it more successfully when they have that data on the business case and it gives them that confidence and assurance if they have pushback within the organisation or they have real anxieties looking at the economic outlook. So I think those are the two components of its success. And I think building the living wage places scheme is another string to its bow. Great. Gail, thanks for that. And thanks for your time today and your support of the, the Good Employment Charter. We, we will work with you moving forward. And there's a, a, a range of issues that we could work together on in terms of understanding uh, elements of good employment better. So look forward to working with you, Gail, and thanks very much indeed for your contribution today. I'm sure um, it's given everybody uh, a real um, insight to some of the challenges that lie ahead for us all. Um, we will next month 
have our um, employment law update session on our webinar. Um, it was almost a year ago that we had our last uh, employment law update and that was a physical event. We actually met together uh, in the centre of Manchester, a, a nice building just at the edge of Ancoats um, and um, ACAS will be supporting us again. It proved incredibly popular last time and I hope to see you all at the next one. Um, so it only leaves for me to thank you once again, Gail, thank, thank everyone for attending today. Um, the webinar will be available on our website and uh, all the notes and um, links to Gail's report will also be uh, on the site. Thanks very much. Have a good afternoon.